folks, Chris Rich, AZ Fly Shop. Welcome back to the channel. You bet. Hey folks, in this video, I'm going to give you the 12 step program to catching the canal carp in the wintertime. Now, we love to chase the carp in the canal. There's lots of carp in the canal. They're super challenging. Uh, they put up a good fight. They give a good tug. The tug is the drug. The bent pole is the goal. All that happens. They are tougher. They're tough fish to catch. The carp in the canal are tough to catch any time of year. The winter time, they seem to have slowed down and they're even tougher to catch. I'm seeing a lot of people, I'm hearing a lot of people saying, hey, they're just not eating anymore. Not necessarily true. They are eating. It's a lot tougher to catch them. I've spent some time doing it. I have had some success. I see some people having success. Certainly, it seems like a warmer day, the middle of the day, later in the day, they seem to be eating a little more. Anyhow, I'm going to take you through the 12 steps that are going to make a difference for you. I'm going to break this down in the video here. And by the way, uh, I'm not saying I'm the greatest at catching these carp. I know some guys that are really, really good at catching these carp. And all these steps that I'm going to walk you through are not hard, fast rules. This is just my experience sharing it with you. We have a lot of people on social media coming into the shop. How do you catch these? What? How, I, I want to do this. I, and once people do start doing it, they're hooked. They love, it's a great game. It's right in town. Uh, I've taken people out on their lunch hour and caught a canal carp. Anyhow, we're in the winter time. We're in December. It's a cooler year in Arizona. We've had a little bit of stormy weather, some cloudy days here just recently. The carp are a little tougher to catch. Let's jump into the steps. Number one, as I've been saying, these fish are very difficult to catch, folks. They spook very easily. Uh, they uh, just kind of meander around. They have a plethora of food in the canal and they can eat whatever, whenever. And so they're a very difficult fish to catch. Their behavior, in my observation, seems to change from day to day. Some days they're not as spooky. Some days, you know, you get within 100 feet or 50 yards of them, even 150 feet, and they're, they're gone. Uh, so they are very difficult. So first of all, no going into the game. They're not an easy fish to catch. When I catch one, I feel like I caught the dumb one. And that's kind of what I'm looking for is where is that dumb fish? Folks, don't get discouraged. They're very difficult to chase. They're very challenging to get hooked up. Step number two, you've got to determine, are you chasing a grass carp or a common carp? Now there are some other carp, some mere carp, some koi, uh, potentially some buffalo carp in the canals. So there's a lot of different types of carp, but primarily there's a lot of grass carp, the white ammers, SRP puts those carp in the canals, and then there are a bunch of common carps in the canal. Their behavior, the way they eat, what they go after is definitely different. The flies that we use, we're gonna talk about that in one of the future steps here. The first step is to determine are you chasing a grass carp or a common carp? And I'm going to show you, let's take a look at some of the differences, right? Here's a, a picture or video of some grass carp cruising in the canal. A lot of times you'll see these grass carp bunched together. Very seldom do you see the common carp bunched together. The grass carp are going to be cruising a little bit more. They're in the mid to the upper water column. Traditionally, very seldom do they go down and pick something up off the bottom. Occasionally, I've seen them do that, but they're typically going to be mid column and maybe up on the surface. They're eating vegetation. That's why SRP put them in is to keep the vegetation in the canal down. And so, you know, got to keep that in mind when you're chasing the white ammers, or as we like to call them, the grass carp. Now, the common carp are typically going to be eaten off of the bottom. And we'll take a look at, at some of these common carp right here. When they're eaten, they're generally what they do, we'd call it tailing or mudding. And they're on the bottom, they're sucking off the bottom, eating whatever kind of eggs or insects or food that they find there. Their tail will be up in the water column. So you'll see this puff of dust in the canal and if you see a tail moving in there that's a common carp and what you want to do is is be able to cast that fly past that and drag it into that zone 
One of the things I've discovered in chasing these fish this time of year is they don't move real fast to go for food. In fact, a lot of times they're not even moving at all. It's a lot of times with those common carp, it's a guess set. Like, hey, I think I'm in that zone. Gosh, it, he might have inched over. Oh, got one. Now, 80% of the time I pick my rod up, there's nothing there. Uh, again, this time of year. Summertime, it'll be a little bit different. Anyhow, step number two. Determine if you're chasing a grass carp or a common carp. Your tactics will be definitely a little bit different. Rods that we like to use, uh, step number three or tip number three. I generally use a six weight when I'm fishing the canal carp. I've caught these canal carp on a four weight. I've caught them on a five weight. I've caught them on an eight weight. Now, what I have found is the six weight for me is a magical kind of middle ground where I'm, the line is not hitting the water so hard. To me, when I fish with my eight weight, that line that is heavier, it hits the water and I spook a lot more fish. Okay, now I know, do know some guys like to fish a seven or an eight weight on the canal. They have success. That's great. I just for myself have found that that six weight is a real good middle ground. Again, I've landed them on four weights, five weights. I even landed uh, a 45 pound grass carp several months back on a six weight on the canal. The beauty of the canals is that we can follow those fish unless you get to a bridge where they go underneath the bridge and you can't follow them anymore. But you can just walk the dog, kind of walk along as they follow, right? If I'm out on a river or out on a lake, I hook into a big 45 pound carp on a six weight, probably not gonna get that fish in. I'm stuck in one spot, the fish can go wherever they wanna go. I'm probably not gonna get that fish in. My magic rod I like to use is a six weight. I use a floating line, a line that matches up well with the rod. Uh, so just about any kind of floating line, as long as it's gonna function well with the rod that you've got is gonna make it, is gonna work for you. Tip it, tip number four. What type of tippet and leader material do we like to use? So I predominantly will use on the canals a 4X fluorocarbon tippet section. You know, uh, fluorocarbon versus nylon or monofilament. Some people have a preference. I think that the, fluor that the fluorocarbon is a little bit stronger. It's a little more abrasion resistant. Um, it seems to, you know, disappear in the water a little bit more and so I'll use 4x sometimes I'll use 3x but a lot of times it's just 4x the six weight rod will protect that tippet pretty well uh, very seldom do I break fish off I do fish with people that occasionally will put on 5x when things are tough they break off a lot of these canal carp I, I personally don't think it's strong enough I know a lot of people on the canals that fish with 3x or 2x even uh, are the numbers that different? I don't know that they're all that different. I like to use the 4X fluorocarbon. Um, Umpqua, we've got their tippets and leaders in the shop. Again, I like to use the fluorocarbon, either a 4X or a 3X. Predominantly, I'm gonna use the 4X. The leader that I like to use is I like to use these Umpqua carp leaders. They come in both nylon and fluorocarbon. Now, folks, these are, these are eight pound. I can go with a 10 pound leader as well. They're 12 feet long. I do think that they make a difference. These leaders are specifically designed for carp fishing. Now, what, what's the difference in this? They're, the butt section, it, it's a little bit heavier section going down further down the leader and so what I found is it'll turn those flies over on that longer leader a little bit easier than say a nine foot trout leader. Uh, I've definitely, I've been out there and I've tried to make the nine foot trout leader work for me. I'll put a longer section of tippet on that so that my fly line is a little further away. Uh, it lands a little further away from where my fly lands. What I've found is that there's some difficulty in getting some of these flies to turn over on that, you know, 12, foot leader per se on that nine foot trout leader. They're just designed to throw stuff a little bit differently than what this carp fishing is. Certainly not mandatory, but I have found a lot of success with these carp leaders from Umqua. So that's tip number four, leader and tippet. 
flies that we like to use. Tip number five, what are the flies? People come in, hey, how do I catch these? What are the flies that we use? Folks, I've caught them on a lot of different flies. If we're chasing grass carp, these are the flies. All of these flies I've caught grass carp on in the past. My favorite combination with the grass carp is this kind of a fluffy chartreuse egg. I put floatant on it and a green, lime green or pea green, even a chartreuse green worm. And what I generally will do is I will put this floatant on the egg. I'll drop the worm maybe 18 to 24 inches below. I want the worm to sink and I'll leave the egg up on top. This has been the number one producer. Occasionally they'll come up and whack the egg. Uh, and it's a real, not a whack, it's a real subtle take. But a lot of times they'll grab this worm. Now, when you're looking at this uh, happening and, and why I like to have that egg up on top is you're going you're gonna to see the fish potentially move, kind of maybe you're drifting it through where there's a pod of these grass carp. A lot of the takes, this egg is just coming down the canal real slow and it pauses for a second or two. That's a fish has just put it in his mouth. And if you don't set that, you don't pick up that rod, you're going to miss that fish because they'll put it in their mouth. They'll let go of it. And a lot of times you won't even recognize it. Occasionally you'll see that egg move. They will move it. It's not going to typically move a whole lot when they realize that that uh, is not a piece of vegetation. They're going to let go of it right away. Now I've also caught the grass carp on this little guy. It's a beaded kind of a little chartreuse piece. I've definitely caught grass carp on that. A little damselfly underneath the egg. I've caught grass carp on those guys. I've caught grass carp on these weightless leech patterns. The hail bop, the black leech, the olive leech. I've even floated this olive leech uh, on top of the water and I've had them, you know, kind of looks like it could be a piece of moss or something and they might grab that. Occasionally, if they're not wanting to grab any of this, I do see them trying to grab something. I might take one of these eggs and that doesn't have floating on it and try to let it sink real, real slow and see if they won't grab that egg. Even uh, if I'm going to fish something subsurface or two subsurface, I'm going to have, generally, I like to have that egg and then maybe I'll put a leech and let it sink again, 18 to 24 inches below the egg. And that way I can generally see that is going to sink real, real slow in the water column. And I'll see it move just a little bit, or I'll see it pause even underneath the water. I know that maybe they didn't grab that, but they, they might've grabbed the dropper. And again, it gives me an opportunity to set that hook. Again, not exhaustive on what we catch the grass carp on, but these are very good flies. I've caught grass carp on all of these flies. Again, my number one go-to combination is that kind of the fluffy egg with floatant and the worm uh, as a dropper below that. Now, for the common carp, again, generally, they're going to be on the bottom foraging. You're looking for a tailing fish or a mudding fish. All of these flies have produced common carp for me. And generally, if you can find those common carp mudding, and you can pull something into that zone, they're generally gonna pick it up. Now, one of the things this time of year, what I've discovered is you don't see them move very far to go get that fly. A lot of times in the summertime, if it's close, they'll move and you'll see movement, you know to set the hook. So a lot of my fish that I've been catching lately, I'm not even really seeing that fish move I just know that I'm in the zone about 80% of the time. I pick my rod up. There's nothing there, you know, 10 to 20% of the time the fish was on it and we've got a tug. We've got a good fight going on. So folks, a lot of these flies um, are going to ride hook side up. Okay. These carp candies, these carp ticklers in different colors. So they're going to kind of come across the bottom like this. All right. They're all going to be, they've all been productive for me. They've got the dumbbell eyes. They're kind of designed to ride hook side up. So they're a little weedless. Even this guy might be a mini craw. Okay. 
And again, what we want to do is cast these, cast these flies beyond where that fish is tailing and then drag that real slow, real slow. I mean, I'll generally move that line, you know, a couple of inches at a time and pause and wait. So again, tip number five, flies that we like to use for these carp. Again, not exhaustive, but certainly these flies are very, very productive. Tip number six, step number six, casting to these canal carp. A couple things I want you to be aware of in this situation. First of all, watch your back cast. So a lot of times on the canals, there's going to be places where we've got a, you know, a lot of room in our back cast. And then suddenly we come up and there's a bunch of trees behind us. We aren't able to back cast. So I see a lot of people not paying attention. Oh, I'm hooked up way in the tree. We just lost a fly. We got to start all over. Uh, the other thing to be watching out for is you could have power lines behind you. You could have fences behind you. You could have pedestrians or people exercising, riding their bike along the canal bank, walking their dog. It's something to watch out for. Sometimes they're aware of you there and they'll, they'll tell you, but you want to pay attention. And, you know, if somebody's coming, be aware that you don't cast back and, and hook someone coming. The other thing I've found is that a lot of these, a lot of times you're going to have to make a longer cast. These carp won't let you get real close to them. The other thing that I found is if I'm false casting several times to make that cast work, most of the time, whoosh, those fish are gone, right? Even that fly line or the leader and the fly kind of going over the top of the fish, I've seen that spook the fish, whoosh, they split out. So I try to minimize the number of back casts that I'm making. And I also, you know, th this is an opportunity to really hone your casting skills, okay? If I'm trout fishing and I've got fish that are feeding in an area, you know, if I get it in that zone within a three to four foot range, I mean, generally the trout is going to find that fly and eat it. Not true with the carp on the canal. A lot of times what I've found is that zone, if you want to increase your chances, it's about like maybe a six inch diameter that's going to really help increase. You're almost force feeding. Those fish are up there eating on top and you almost want to drift that that uh, dry fly, that egg that I use, drift that right into where their zone is. Very seldom will you see them move very far to go get that. Now, occasionally, these grass carp will have a reaction bite. Something hits, and maybe one out of a hundred times, they'll, you know, it hits off to the side. Just not, again, if it's two feet away from them, they're probably not going to go to it. If it's behind them, they're probably not going to go to it. So it's got to be what I've discovered is something out in front of them. Okay. And you want to have that real close range. One out of a hundred times, potentially it hits and there's a little bit of a reaction bite. Fantastic. We love that. So cast into these fish, it's a real good opportunity to hone your casting skills. Uh, you want to cast in that little window or work on getting in that small window of opportunity for those fish. Minimize your false cast. Watch out for uh, people hiking and watch out for your back cast. Step number seven. The carp on the canal have a tendency to be extremely spooky. Uh, you'd think with all the people walking by and all the activity that they would get used to it. it. It doesn't seem to be the case. They seem to be spookier than carp anywhere else that I chase. Again, the false casting is going to spook those fish. You want to minimize the number of false casts. Your shadow, you've got to watch where your shadow's at. The shadow will spook those fish. It doesn't even have to go over the top of them. They can just maybe see it off to the side and that'll spook them. The other thing that'll spook these fish are ducks swimming up the canal. If I'm working up a canal and there's ducks in front of me, it's, it's a tough situation. I try to get myself in front of those ducks if I can because those, I've seen those carp, they push off when those ducks come. If you've got pedestrians walking on the other side of the canal, those carp are going to change. They're going to swim off when those pedestrians come. They'll reset generally pretty quickly, but they're going to spook with those pedestrians. Sometimes you've got a work truck, an SRP work truck coming down the canal. They're going to spook the fish off. So again, these fish are very, very spooky. There is the occasional day that there's a fish 
that's not super spooky. I don't know, again, what the difference is. The patterns on these fish seem to change from day to day. I'd love to say I've got it figured out, folks. I don't have it figured out. Tip number eight, fish where the fish are. If you want to catch these canal carp, you've got to fish where there are fish. What do I mean by that? Folks, you've got to be able to see the fish. I have never caught a canal carp just blind fishing, blind casting, like maybe I'm working a shoreline for bass. I'm just blind casting to that shoreline. Or maybe I'm working in an area for trout. A lot of that's blind casting. Folks, when you're doing the canal carp fishing, almost all this is going to be in fact, all of mine have been sight fishing. I can see there's some activity. I can see that there's fish either feeding on the surface, they're cruising somewhere, there's fish in the area. I'm casting to those fish, okay? Maybe I see a mud puff and I see a tail. Hey, that's probably a common carp. Let's cast, try to drag that through that zone, okay? So you've got to fish where the fish are. And you've got to wear polarized glasses so you can see into the water a little bit better. Also, real good for safety when you're fly fishing, always have your glasses on. But fish where the fish are, walk slowly. As you're walking down the canal, you want to walk real slow because sometimes you might, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've been walking and suddenly right down the bank from me, whoosh, there's a big dust cloud. I just spooked off two carp because I wasn't paying attention. I was walking maybe a little bit too fast. But you want to walk slow and kind of keep your eye out and see what you can find there. Step number nine, presentation. Okay, folks, we, we got our, our favorite rod, right? We got the floating line. We've got the leader that we like. We've, we've selected the fly. We've identified we're chasing a grass carp or a common carp. Presentation, okay going to be different for a grass carp than for a common carp. The grass carp, predominantly, again, I like to use that egg and that worm. Occasionally, I'll use something else, and occasionally, I'll strip something or let something swing in the water column. But what I found, again, it's very occasional. If, if other methods aren't working for me, the dry dropper is not working, I'll go to the swing method or a stripping type method. But folks, you've got to be able to land that fly fairly delicately. Even on my most delicate presentation, the fish take off. This is just part of what happens when you're chasing these carp, folks. I try to, get, I try to lead it, get it out in front of the carp. A lot of these fish are going to spook when it hits the water. Sometimes I'll make a nice presentation. It'll be out there. Maybe it's drifting right to the carp. It looks like they're going to take it. It gets real close to them. <laughs> they take off. Okay. I've had these grass carp come up on my, dry, on my dry egg and put it on their nose and push that fly around in the water. And you think, open your, just open your mouth. And then they just slowly swim off. But presentation is critical, folks. You want to make that gentle cast. You want to get it in that nice tight pocket where it's just out in front of them, going to drift into them just a little bit. Occasionally, you'll get that reaction bite. Okay. Now, the common carp presentation, I've talked about it a little bit. What I'm going to do there is when I make that cast, I'm going to want to cast my fly. These flies that we're going to use for the common carp, they've got some weight on them, right? And we want them to cast past where that carp is feeding, where they're mudding, and we're going to let it get to the bottom, and we're going to slowly strip that back through that area where they're mudding. Again, this time of year, what I've noticed is that I haven't seen those common carp move very far at all or any movement, and I just have to guess, hey, I think I'm in that zone. Hey, it's got to be right there. Guess pick up. Oh, I got one. Now, 80% of the time you pick up, it's not there. But the presentation is, is actually very critical, folks. You want to make that cast where you're going to be able to drag that uh, common carp fly right in front of where they're at. The grass carp, you want to be able to hit that window real tight right out in front of them where they can see it. Hopefully, we don't spook them. Sometimes a perfect cast, we're still going to spook these carp. T tip number 11, landing the canal carp. I generally like to have someone with me to help me land that fish. I don't always have that, 
but there is some safety that you want to be aware of. You do not want to fall into the canal. Um, if you've got someone with you, you fall in, you know, at least you've got someone to help you get out. Now, what we look for is we're going to look for either the ladders or the steps in the concrete on the canal. Those ladders are generally painted in, in, in a bright yellow. And so if I look on that other side of the canal and I can see the ladders or the steps over here, they're going to be about every 100 yards on that side. And on my side, they're alternated. They're still 100 yards apart, but halfway between on the opposite side of where those, that, uh, those yellow painted steps are at, on my side is going to be the steps. So I'll look, see where the steps are. Okay, let's go up a little bit. I'll try to find that step. Sometimes there's a little bit of distance and a real steep grade to get down to the ladder. And there's where I really like to have someone. I can hold on to one end of the net, lower myself down to where I get to the steps, take the net, work down the steps, get that, let that fish come in, get him in the net. These fish are big, folks. Your trout net, your short-handled trout net that you're going to use on a river or a stream, probably not going to do the job for these fish. Not uncommon to catch a 30 or 40 pound carp. You're going to need to have a big rubber type net. I recommend having a longer handled net. Again, it gives you something to hold on to when you're lowering yourself down from your buddy. And it also gives you a little more reach to get that carp in the net. But be real careful when you go down to net these fish. I don't want to have you falling in the canal. Uh, I haven't heard of anybody getting in trouble. I have heard of somebody losing their balance, falling in, and they can easily get back to the step and get out. But be real careful when you go to land these fish. We don't want to have you fall in. Step number 12, if you want to catch these canal carp, do it more often. Just like anything, folks, if we spend more time doing it, we're going to get better at it. We're going to get better at presentation. We're going to get better at making that cast. We're going to get better at sighting and seeing those fish. It does take an effort to do all these things and be able to do them right. Folks, there's your 12 steps, 12 tips for catching the canal carp during the winter time. Folks, if you have additional questions, concerns, comments, you can leave a comment in the comment section. Stop in the shop. Ask us. We're happy to walk you through any of these, uh, share you the flies, show you areas of the canal that we've had success on. Um, tell us what's working for you. Happy to be in a dialogue. I know these are not an exhaustive way. There's other people that have better methods, potentially. Uh, anyhow. These are the 12 steps that have really made a difference for a lot of the people that I end up getting out and fishing with. Hey folks, if you enjoyed the video, hit the like, subscribe button, stop in the shop, tell us what's working. I'll see you at the shop.